Someone who knows how to make it happen is Peter Sheehan. He's a world-renowned speaker and the author of three books, Generation Y, Flip and Making It Happen. Today he's going to share some advice and tips on how to make our lives better and also how to be more effective and efficient in our workplaces and with clients. Today we're with author, speaker and entrepreneur Peter Sheehan. Peter, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Pleasure. So Peter, you've got a new book out, it's called Making It Happen. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Uh, the book is basically about how to get things done. Not in yes. terms of time management perspective, but if I go through another meeting with another potential entrepreneur with a great idea that never does anything with it, I think I'm going to scream. And how do we know whether it's the right idea? How do we prioritise what's a... How do we know if it's a good idea or not? Well, that's kind of like saying <laughs> how big's a house and how, how should you build it, right? I mean, the best way to test if your idea's any good is take it to market. And I think mm -hmm. too often we wait too long before we take things to market. And as a result, we never get to test it on the people who actually have to write checks for what we want. And in healthcare, we kind of find that we try and look for things like evidence-based practice and things like that, and that takes time. How do we balance that out, do you think? I think there's nothing, in healthcare, the consequences of getting it wrong is that people can die. So I have absolutely yes. no problem with evidence-based practice mm -hmm. in medicine. I think sometimes what happens in the healthcare system is we think it's all too big a problem to solve, yeah. so we don't even start with the small ones. And what if it's not to do with patient care? What if it's just with managing systems or with you know, changing something within the company or within the organisation or within the government department that we're working for? Well, I think that's exactly the point, right? Yeah. You should get started on something, anything, no matter how small it is. Now, yeah. at the end of the day, everything eventually affects patient care, but you can't mm -hmm. use patient care as an excuse for not doing anything. Mm -hmm. And what if, we've, what if we're working in a bureaucracy and we feel like we can't make changes ourselves? Well, everything's a bureaucracy. I don't care whether <laughs> you're working in the private sector, the public sector, healthcare, military. It's all a bureaucracy. There's rules, there's regulations, there's policies. It's a cop out. And what about our strategic planning? We tend to make these big, long strategic plans. I heard you speak a couple of days ago and you said that maybe that's not the best way to do it. Um, well, you got to take it, you know, it depends what industry you're talking about. Yeah. I would like to think that the people running the health system would be thinking more than quarter by quarter. Yep. So they should certainly be doing long-term strategic thinking, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean their execution plans have to be 10 years long. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one thing to talk to a, small, uh, a consumer electronics company about rolling out new products and getting to market sooner. I think healthcare really does have its own unique issues to deal with, and therefore the planning cycle, it's no different to infrastructure and government, is going to naturally be longer. But the, the, the risk is the further out you go, the more locked into one idea you get and you fail to innovate new practice, new opportunities. And do we have to do things differently from how we're doing them now or how we did them in the past? Is health going to change as much as the rest of the world? Oh, I don't think uh, you need me to answer that question. I think most people in healthcare are pretty clear that there's some things that are going to have to change. I mean, the mm -hmm. inefficiencies in the system yeah. is ultimately the issue. If and, and, and the challenge is that you've got to balance this kind of private enterprise component of health and the social good component of health. Yeah. So the social good component means you can't operate entirely in a free market, mm -hmm. but by not operating entirely in a free market, you run the risk of greater inefficiencies, et cetera, as well. So I think the real challenge policymakers have in healthcare is balancing the social need with a more efficient way of getting things done. And if you were advising the policymakers, what's two or three things that you'd give advice about? I would frankly leave advice to the policymakers up to the experts in policy and healthcare. If I was yeah. advising the people in the practice of operating healthcare organisations, yep, I would good. be pushing them to one, embrace much greater use of technology, mm -hmm. two, to work heavily on the culture and the internal brand story about what it means to work in healthcare. I think cultures are a really serious issue right now in healthcare. And third, I would try and break this kind of cycle of if I went through it this way, you can go through it the same way. I actually think that part of the way you create greater innovation at step one is to change some of the cultures of, you know, I had to work 80 hours a week, so you can work 80 <laughs> hours a week, which is number three, which would also lead to this kind of new narrative and this new story about what it means to work in healthcare. So back to technology, just for a little bit. 
Do you mean like by improving the technology that delivers patient care or technology in general or can you just explain that a little bit more? Well I think there's a whole host of areas that you could apply technology in healthcare. Number one is definitely in patient care, yeah. most importantly for the transition of carer in the delivery of patient care. Mm -hmm. So there's some really interesting things happening out there around, in, around databases, the use of multiple portable devices mm -hmm. um, that actually improve the transition time and the change over time when carer shifts. I think one of the big issues when you've got limited resources like they do in healthcare is knowing what equipment you've got, where it is, when you need it, and who can go and find it. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing some great use of unified communications. Uh, we're seeing great use of GPS technology in healthcare right mm -hmm. now. So you know where the cardi cardiograph cardiographic machine, I'm making that up, I don't even know what it's called, right? But you know <laughs> where that is. Machine. But you also know where the nursing staff are, yep. the anaesthetist is, the surgeons are, literally using GPS based technology. When they're in the hospital or yeah. when they're like no, grocery or, shopping? Well in the hospital hopefully <laughs> just for privacy reasons. But think about it. If you're in the OR and there yeah. is a serious issue that you're dealing with, an emergency, yeah. and you don't know where a certain machine is or a certain nurse is or a certain other surgeon is in the hospital, mm. you could waste 40 minutes Finding that equipment, finding that someone yeah. can die in that 40 minutes. Yeah. I'm seeing awesome stuff on rostering systems in hospitals mm -hmm. right now. I know a hospital, can't say who it is, who are trialing a rostering system of supply and demand. That is wow. Saturday shifts pay more than Monday shifts because less people want the Saturday shift and more people want the Monday shift. So they're setting a capped mm -hmm. expenditure on labour, which is obviously a key component yeah. of healthcare, but they're also allowing people to choose where and when they're going to go. So there's technology, that's like mm -hmm. the semantic web almost, or predictive markets or free market systems driving rostering systems. So you could go start to finish and unpack the opportunities in healthcare. In uh, the giving of blood and the donating yeah. of blood right now, they now have machines that can separate the red cells and the plasma mm -hmm. and all the different things without taking full samples of people's blood. Yeah. They now have syst machines that can take blood from a patient right now while also intravenously injecting vitamins to give them the post giving a like to get rid of that lull and give them a kick of energy i mean we could keep going i mean the list is endless <laughs> yep. and what, what about making a here? difference a lot of your books i've read your books and i think that you know a theme there is about making a difference in this world how do you think that we can make a difference but still keeping with our evidence base but maybe just thinking a little bit differently what are some practices that we can get into thinking yeah. that differently well, I think first is stop thinking they're mutually exclusive. Yeah. Like practice-based medicine and wanting to make a difference to me are exactly the same yes. thing. In fact, you're so caring about making a difference, you want evidence to support That's what right. you're going to try. So I think part of that idea of number two, which was retelling the story of what it's like to work in healthcare, I think yeah. is unleashing that spirit of I would like yeah. to change the world for good. Yeah. Uh, I think if we, could rem if we could constantly as leaders in healthcare remind the people working in healthcare just how important what they do is. That would begin to bridge those gaps. And as managers, do we do that? Or governments do that? Or how do we, how well, do we change think, that? I mean, everyone? The easy answer is everyone has <laughs> to do that, right? I'm in the middle of a project for a retailer right now. Yeah. Everyone that works in that retail that's been in our focus group, we're, we're looking at brand and culture and internal stuff, mm -hmm. really identifies with the brand, loves the brand, hates their managers hates them. So there's major disengagement, lots of spoilage and theft in the store, like it's just yeah. a disaster, right? And it's got nothing to do with the brand, it's got nothing to do with policy, it's that they don't like their boss. Mm. So you could start with better <laughs> skilling, shift managers, shift supervisors, head nurses, oh, mm. I mean, whatever the kind of titles are, start by better skilling them on how to deal with their people, particularly with the generational issues that are starting yeah. to take place in, in healthcare as well. And something that we find in healthcare and probably in other industries as well is that we do have that type of philosophy. The longer that you're there, the higher up on the chain that you get. So if we're a young health professional, how can we, how do we manage ourselves in those types of situations, do you think? I think we overplay just how prevalent the whole the longer you've been there, the higher up you go thing is. Yeah. I think that's usually a young person's excuse for not having made it further <laughs> along. Frankly, Good idea. At, at some level, right, <laughs> People who do great work get noticed, period. I don't care whether you're in the government, I don't care whether yeah. you're in healthcare, I don't care whether, whether you work for an investment bank. Yeah. And you can't be two years out of university going, I know everything about healthcare, I know how to fix yeah. it, with no understanding of the complexity that goes into the politics of that, the funding of that. The, I mean... Yeah, it's huge. Yeah, so... Basically, do good work. Do good work, what a concept. It's kind of <laughs> like marketers right now are realizing yeah. they can't just brand their way to greatness. They actually have to make good products and that therefore builds the brand. We'll apply that to the personal brand of the young healthcare professional and you start going, be good. And all of a sudden, visibility starts to come with that. Yeah. Peter, thank you so much for speaking with us today. It's a pleasure. Thank you.
We've just been speaking with Peter Sheehan, author, speaker and entrepreneur. Peter, thank you so much for speaking with us today. It's a pleasure.